Um, any other questions that anyone has about it? So I, the reason why I'm not doing the same presentations over again is because I get a bit bored with that, <laughs> to be frank. <laughs> so it's a bit based on my laziness, I suppose. But um, I, I find that once I've done a presentation, um, it requires a lot of... Uh, presentations have a lot of interaction between myself and the audience. And, and so if I'm doing a presentation again, I, I have to feel that the audience needs that presentation. Does that make sense? And so there's that interaction going on. And so sometimes... And I've got so many more subjects. So there's, I keep adding more subjects, and at the moment I've still got a list of 30 or 40 subjects that I'd like to cover. Um, and that's all the subjects I'd like to cover before I want to start teaching you the real stuff. So that's... <laughs> so, <laughs> not that I haven't taught you the real stuff already, but um, I suppose what I'm getting at is that um, once, uh, once um, I get into an alignment condition, the teaching that I'll be doing with you will be far different than what we're currently doing. And so this sort of period of time is sort of all of the teachings you really needed to help you to get into that at one moment condition with God, basically. So there's a lot of natural love stuff in it and a lot of divine love stuff in it. And, uh, and that's why we've been doing these presentations in that way. And there's also a lot of spirit interaction stuff I would like to do in the future with you at some point. But again, that's, uh, that will be dependent upon different mediums getting themselves up to speed. So that's one of the reasons why we're working through with groups of mediums and healers uh, to do different things as well. And the next session of that I haven't determined yet. You notice I've, I've uh, delayed the next session of the mediumship because I know a number of you are having a lot of trouble with the last lessons that I gave you. And you'll notice that you've been getting a lot of triggers. If you would have frequented any of those forums that I gave you to frequent, you'll notice that all of a sudden there's been a big influx of criticism towards myself, which should hopefully help you deal with that emotions, those emotions that you have of doubt and fear and so forth. So I've let you just stew in that for a little while longer <laughs> and we'll see how you go with that. Today's session, um, I just need to get my eraser. Today's session though, if we get to today's session, which you should all have a handout outline off, and notice I've called it Laws Governing Our Love of Self. Now, remember the last time I introduced, last weekend that we had, I introduced the subject of God's laws, and it was quite um, sort of like a scientific discussion of those laws, and, a, and a, rather than so much a, what we would classify as a religious discussion of those laws. So like the law of gravity, the law of aerodynamics and so forth, the physical laws, and then we went through some of the moral laws, and then we went through some of the spiritual laws and so forth, that all come together to actually govern your soul. Now remember in the introduction we covered how these laws all operate, governing what happens to your soul. And then in the next session, remember we talked about the groups of laws that govern your love of others. In other words, how you love other people. Remember that? So for those of you that were present at that, um, we learnt a lot of things, didn't we, about how love is actually expressed. And you'll notice in that discussion, many of us probably felt quite surprised about some of the subjects we covered. Is that how you, when you walked away, how did you feel? I feel that most of you felt like, wow, there's a lot in loving somebody. <laughs> and there's a lot of different parts to love. It's not just this feeling that we, we say we have, but there's actually a lot of parts to this feeling of love. Love has a lot of attributes and qualities that the majority of us often are not, not aware of and not aware of for, for many years after we pass into the spirit world either. So we covered those laws of love in relation to others. Today's session is about covering the laws of love in terms of how it impacts upon our own treatment of ourself. Now, one of the biggest problems that we have in the universe today is that we don't really know how to love ourselves. And as a result of that, what happens a lot of the time, because we don't know how to love ourselves, we finish up getting into this situation where we treat ourselves quite badly in our interactions with other people. But we don't even know it. 
And then because we treat ourselves quite badly in, inter in our interactions, there are laws that are broken in the, at the soul level that then mean we experience pain. So the majority of us end up feeling like love equals pain. Now you think about that in your own in your own life. How many times have you thought yourself to be in love and yet had this terrible, painful feeling that you felt maybe with a breakup of a relationship, for example? Well, love in its purest state does not feel that pain. So if I'm feeling some pain, then it means that I'm breaking some kind of law of love and there's an emotion, there's an emotional reason inside of myself that causes me to feel the pain. Now, when you get to a condition of abundant with God, all pain about love disappears. So that's pretty good, isn't it? So it means that any relationship you could have in the future, no matter who it's with, family, parents, children, a husband or a wife or a partner, any relationship you could have, a business relationship, a work relationship, all these different types of relationships you could experience, none of them will cause you pain. But the basis of that is about how you display love towards yourself as well as towards others. Now the reason why we covered others first is because most of the time most of us have little problems in recognising our treatment of others in the sense that we often have a lot of difficulty with our treatment of ourselves. Oftentimes what happens with the treatment of ourselves is we're either treating ourselves in a place where we feel we're better or higher than or more important than others, which is actually an unloving way to treat yourself as well as others, or we believe ourselves to be lower and less than others. And so we have a lot of really strong emotions about being less than and unworthy of others. Now, either one of those states, feeling that we're more than others or feeling that we're less than others, is going to be a space where we're not loving to ourselves or others. And there is one particular principle that we need to remember in all of our dealings, and that's this principle. Sacrificing myself to love another And I'll put love in quotation marks, because it's not real love here. Sacrificing myself to love another is not loving to myself or the other. So sacrificing myself to love another person is not actually loving to myself and because it's not loving to myself it's also not loving to the other person. Now if you think about how much in your life you've sacrificed yourself in order to love another, and most of us have done that at some time, right? Sacrificed our desires, sacrificed our passions, we've not done the work we wanted, we've not done the schooling we've wanted, the education we wanted, we've not done the art we wanted or the music we wanted or all of those things in order to please somebody else. Every time we did that we weren't loving to ourselves or to the other person. Right? And that's a basic principle we need to remember in all of our dealings with ourself. As soon as you enter this process of sacrifice, you immediately create pain in your own life and in the lives of other people too, believe it or not. Because can you see, the, as soon as you sacrifice yourself, the other person's not getting you. They're getting a fictitious you. They're getting a you that's been modified to suit them. Now some people will like that if they are not loving to themselves or to you, but other people, if they really want a close and truthful relationship with you, will be deeply saddened by that. Now the kind of person that you want to have a relationship with in the end is the kind of person who wants to know the real you. But for many of us, we don't even want to know the real self. We don't even want to know the real me because we have these feelings of deep shame or other feelings that we have from our childhood about the real us. And so what we finish up doing is we 
modify ourselves in our presentation to others. So what we want to do today is have a look at these laws. Remember, they're the same kind of laws that we talked about in the session about sacrificing, in the session about the laws governing the love of others. These are the same laws. You'll find, in fact, when you look through the two outlines that I've prepared, they're the same headings pretty much. But this time we're looking at it from the point of view of ourselves. Now, there's a lot of spirits with us here today as well. Now, some of those spirits are in a state where they are actually feeling quite angry and upset with me, so you'll have to just bear with them for a, for a bit as well. There are other spirits here who have a deep feeling that it's impossible to love themselves, and that's why they're here too. And uh, many of us have brought along some of these spirits with us, and what, we'll, what I'd like to do is just acknowledge their presence and also ask that they can just stop projecting neediness emotions at yourselves so that you can feel your own emotions about the discussion. So that's hopefully what they'll do. So let's get started. The first law. What's the first law that we discussed last time? Was the law of free will. So let's uh, write the laws up one at a time. So the law of free will is again, I'm allowed to do anything I want, whether what I want to do is actually harmonious with love and actually building up other people, or if it's disharmonious with love and even destroying other people. I'm allowed to do whatever I want. So this is a primary law that God gave us, the gift of free will that God gave to every single person in the entire universe, not just to people on this earth. So how does that affect our love of self? So let's look at how this law affects my love of myself. Well, if I am in a state where I respect the law of free will within myself, every single time another person tries to get me to do what they want to do, and I don't want to do it, I would respect the fact that I don't want to do it. So mum comes home from a hard day's work and the family wants her to cook a meal. She doesn't want to cook a meal. But she does it anyway because she feels like she has to and she's the only one who can cook good in the family. right? She's just broken the law of free will towards herself. Does that make sense? Just by doing that one thing. Now, people would justify that and say, oh, and I'm just going to turn down the mic a little bit. People would justify that and say, oh, you know, that's a loving thing to do. But remember we said right at the beginning, if I'm sacrificing myself in order to love another, I am not loving to myself or the other. Remember I said that? Right at the beginning. So, in this case, if the woman comes home and, she's and she doesn't want to make it, she doesn't have to be any reason for it. It might be that she is tired or it might be that she feels something else. But she doesn't even have to have a single reason to do this. She can just say, I don't want to make a meal tonight. And everyone in the family, if they projected at her anger for not making a meal for them that night, they are also out of harmony with the law of free will. But you see, when we're on the receiving end of other people's anger, what do we normally try to do? We try to appease them. We try to make them feel better, right? So anger is actually a way that people use to control us. Can you see that? Whenever, if I'm angry at somebody, I am actually wanting to control that person. I want them to do whatever I expect. So the instant that another person, so myself, let's say as myself, I decide I don't want to cook a meal tonight. Of course, uh, according to God's other laws, that would also mean that I don't probably want to eat the meal tonight. And if I expected somebody else to cook for me, that would also be unloving, wouldn't it? So if I was the woman coming home from work and I say, I don't want to cook a meal tonight, so I don't cook a meal, and nobody else cooks a meal for me and I get angry, then now I'm out of harmony with the law of free will. Can you see that? But if I'm feeling free will as a, paramount, as a paramount law within my love of myself, what that will mean then is that I feel 
allowed to do whatever I wish. Now, most people around you do not let you do whatever you wish. In fact, most of us were taught from at a very young age that we're not allowed to do whatever we wish. In fact, not only are we not allowed, it's not practical, you can't live that way, it's selfish, and we get all of these other emotions right pummeled into us from a very young age about actually doing what you are allowed to do. But from God's perspective, God never does that. So God never, never is going to punish you in the future for anything you chose to do. Nothing is a punishment. That doesn't mean, remember from our introductory session, that there isn't consequences, because there are certainly consequences when we break different laws, including the law of free will. The consequence, if I break the law of free will towards myself, is that I will feel the pain of devaluing myself in all of my relationships. Now remember that all of our discussion today is not about using your intellect to get out of the situation. The intellect you can certainly use if you want to actually act more loving to yourself. So in other words, every single time your, your, a, a decision comes to you, you could say, oh, is this in harmony with free will or is this not in harmony with free will? Now, every time you made a decision, that would be pretty complex, wouldn't it? Like, particularly considering how many decisions you make in a day, having to ask that question on every single decision. Like, should I go Sandgate Road or should I go, uh, is this how many with my free will? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? You start getting very complicated things going on when you start asking yourself these questions at an intellectual level. What I am saying is that every single thing that you do is a choice and you're allowed to make any choice you want. However, if you really want to deal with this bringing your soul in harmony with free will, if you're following the divine path, what you would do is you would look at all of the emotions that you have inside of yourself that cause you to not follow your free will. Does that make sense? And you would also look at all of the desires that you have or passions that you have inside of yourself that cause you to actually use your free will in a way that damages another person's free will. Can you see what's going on there? So on one hand, what I would do, I would not start looking at this from an intellectual point of view. What I need to do is allow myself to settle with, into the emotions. Right? So every time I feel like I'm being controlled by another person, I am out of harmony with the law of free will. I am out of harmony with the law of free will. So I'll say that again. Every time I feel like another person is controlling me, I am out of harmony with the law of free will. There's an emotional belief in me that I've got to do what they are attempting to control me to do. And I'm reacting to that emotion. And what I need to do if I want to really be closer to God is release that emotion. So the emotion might be this emotion that if I don't do what they want, they won't love me and I'm avoiding the feeling of being not loved. That might be the emotion. And all I really need to do is feel the feeling of nobody loves me and release that and experience that and release that emotionally. And all of a sudden, I am now automatically not listening to a person who's trying to control me. See, you see, a person can try to control you, but if you are uncontrollable, <laughs> then it doesn't affect you, does it? And really, the law of free will is that you are uncontrollable. That's the law of free will, isn't it, in the end? The law of free will is I'm allowed to do anything I want. Doesn't that make you uncontrollable? Totally. Right? right? So you're allowed to be uncontrollable. Of course, every time you're uncontrollable in an unloving way, there's a consequence from one of God's laws, which will help correct you. But every time you're uncontrollable in a loving way, what will happen is you have more joy and more satisfaction and more beautiful things happening in your life. So this is why we need to be uncontrollable more of the time. Now, what has the world taught us to do with the law of free will? The world has taught us 
that we've got to suppress our desires and passions, even if they are loving. And the world has also taught us that if we have emotions that actually cause us to not value our own free will, we've got to fight for ourselves. And so what do we end up doing in that situation? What we finish up doing is we're in a situation, somebody's trying to control us, and instead of feeling like, he can't control me, I'm fine. We feel like, that person trying to control me, I really, you know, you really want to get start getting angry with them and control them back, or, and sometimes we may even get violent with them, like, to try to prevent them from controlling me. Either way, I'm breaking the law of free will in my treatment, firstly of myself and then of others. I just wondered if we could maybe talk about a question that was posed to me this week and it was about a mum wanting to follow her free will and desire and but one of her children, the mum's in the room, I hope she, she doesn't even know I'm dobbing her in, <laughs> and the child um, wanting their free will was in opposition with mum. So um, she was very conscious of wanting to enable the free will of her child as well as her own. All right, so let's look at what's happening. So mum wants to do, shall we say she wants to move to a new location? Hypothetically. Hypothetically. The child, who just hypothetically happens to be a male, uh, wants to stay where he is. Now, remember the law of attraction law, which was, particularly for parents, the child is actually mirroring my denied emotion. So the first thing is, this male child has the appearance of trying to control his mother, right? He wants to stay where he is, she wants to move. So what emotion does mum need to deal with, firstly? She needs to deal with the fact that men in her life, and it's probably related to her father or some other men in her life, have projected to her all through her life that men get to get what they want and girls or women have to toe the line. Right? Now, if mum deals with that emotion, then the son no longer will reflect that emotion at her because of the law of attraction. Remember, that's what happens with children. The children reflect an emotion to the parent because it's an emotion that the parent is denying. Does that make sense? Now, once the mum deals with that emotion, there's a high likelihood the child will be happy to move for a start. So, there's that, that, so that's one part of the decision. But if we look at this issue of free will with regard to this issue, mum's allowed to do what she wants and the child's allowed to do what he wants. So what do we do? We seem to have a conflict in free wills. Can you see that? Like the child's allowed to stay where it, where it wants to stay and the mum's allowed to move to a new location if that's what she wants. Now, what feelings might mum need to go through before she'd actually allow that to occur? And by the way, it doesn't matter what age the child is. Even if the child's five, the child's allowed to stay where it wants. And if, the, and if the child's 10 or 15 or 20, it doesn't matter what, the child is allowed to stay where it wants. Remember, it's a law of free will and there's also the law, these other laws all apply to the soul from the moment of its inconception, from the moment of its conception or its incarnation. So therefore it's allowed to do what it wants. So mum could decide to actually allow, talk to the son about creating through his own law of attraction to stay where he wants because he's allowed to do that. But if he can't con create through his own law of attraction to stay where he wants, then he might feel that he needs to go with mum, because mum's definitely going. Does that make sense? Now, for many parents, that would be hugely challenging, would it not? Because many parents would say, but they're six years old, or eight years old, or nine years old. I can't do that. Yes, you can. Society doesn't perhaps agree with you doing it, but this, we're not talking about what society agrees with or doesn't agree with here. We're talking about what God's laws are all about. 
You follow me? So God's laws are this child's allowed to do what it wants. But it, it also, if it's learnt God's laws, would have to understand too that it is going to create what it wants through its own soul condition. So if the child wants to really stay at the soul level by itself and the child is in this space of every child, just like every adult, is in a space of creation, the child will automatically create friends or other family members or whatever with whom it can stay so that it can stay in its current location. And the mum would be totally comfortable with that because she'd have released all of her emotions of responsibility and so forth about the child's creations. Does that make sense? Now, of course, if mum releases all those emotions, she may find that the child actually wants to move with mum anyway, which is often the case. Or mum might move and then the child two weeks later says, no, I don't want to stay where I am now. I want to come with mum. And that will be a decision that the child then makes. All of those things are harmonious with love. But it's not harmonious with love for mum to demand the child to travel with it. Is it? Can you see that? It's not harmonious with love. A question about that? It's just... Uh... <laughs> What if the child then wants some money, some bus money to get home? Well, that wouldn't be harmonious with love to give it the, the money either, except perhaps if you, if you realise the child had worked through different emotions about the issue. So let's say mum moved and then the child two weeks later said, oh, I want to come and, and then mum might decide to go and pick it up, for example. What, what have you learnt from that, son? Like, what have you learnt through this whole process? Um, and one of the things he might have learnt was that actually he just didn't want to go because mum wanted to go. <laughs> That might have been one of the things he learnt. Um, he might have learnt too that things are pretty good at home with mum compared to what they could be somewhere else. He might have learnt that too. But it's not something the mother has had to browbeat into him or, or, or pressure him into, into coming to believe. So the, whether he's given money to stay would be a different matter altogether. So let's say he said, oh, I want to stay with such and such, and then and, then, and mum says, well, you know, it's going to be really hard to create that, you know, it just depends on whether they're generous enough and whatever, and let's say a, a, a friend is, so that's fine. But let's say nobody is, and then he expects mum to create that for him. Well, now he's out of harmony with the law of free will. Mum doesn't want to create that for him. Mum wants to create this for herself. Does that make sense? And so mum doesn't have to create that for him. His own law of attraction can create that for him if he knows how to use it through his desire. If it's a pure desire for him to stay where he is, he will create it. And then mum would need to allow it. And the problem for, with most of, of people on earth is that the mums and dads in this situation would very rarely allow it. And you see how their emotions would be getting triggered in the process. So often times the child will learn the lessons very rapidly involved in the transaction, but us as parents often take a lot longer to learn the lesson. Does that make sense? Karen? Hi, AJ. Um, I'm having trouble with um, um, the, a child's not mature and can't, I have judged the child as not making, being able to make mature decisions and um, I would imagine a child feeling very abandoned as well. And yep. I... I just don't understand the practicalities and realities is what I'm calling it. <laughs> well, remember I said in the first discussion about God's laws that every one of God's laws is completely practical in every situation. It's just that we have certain emotional injuries that cause us to believe that it's not practical. So that's the first thing to remember. So the law of free will is a completely practical law in every situation. Even with a child who we believe is making unwise decisions. Like, for most of us who have been parents, at some time in our life, we believed our child was making an unwise decision. If not once, probably many times that we believe that, right? So what do we do in those situations when we believe our child doesn't have the capacity to make the decision? Well, straight away, we are in an unloving state ourselves if we believe that. Can you see why? Because God is basically saying to that child, you're allowed to make any decision you want. Even if it hurts you, you're allowed to make that decision. That's what God's saying to the child. And we're saying to the child, you're allowed to make any decision you want as long as it doesn't hurt you. And who's the judge of whether it hurts you? Me. 
So can you see how that's quite out of harmony with love even in a practical way? If I'm the judge of what hurts you, aren't I straight away out of harmony with love of you? The answer is a yes or no answer. You can say no too. <laughs> I mean, I'm thinking about a two-year-old, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm thinking about a two-year-old too. Who is, um, chooses to stick a, an ele- a metal object into a PowerPoint. Now, I judge that as a parent to be unloving, unwise, and I don't want to go through... Um, Electrocution yeah. problems with the child, and, Un- understandably. And I think, how can that not be... How can that be unloving to prevent their free will if they choose to do that? So why does a child choose to poke a, a knife or a fork into a power socket? Curiosity, perhaps? Lack of awareness? What is the child triggering in the parent? An emotion. What's the emotion? Well, the child is triggering an emotion of fear. What, what other emotions do you feel when you see... Like, I've been in exactly your situation, by the way. When, you, when the child's stuck in a knife into the power socket, what's the emotion you, fe- you feel? Well, fear. Fear. Any others? Um, anxiety. Um, so they're all terror-based yeah, emotions, all fear-based yeah. emotions. Okay. So what's the child triggering? Remember I said, I've said in the past that every thing the child does is a reflection of the parent's denied emotion. So what's the first thing to deal with? I don't know. I'm feeling vulnerable and emotional. <laughs> That's okay. You can still be vulnerable and emotional and feel. What would be the first thing to deal with? Isn't it the fear? Well, my fear. Exactly. Your fear. My fear of loss. Yes. Yeah, that's it. That's the feeling. And you can feel it in you, can't you? Like, that's there. When you deal with that feeling, there's a high likelihood the child will not take that action. And in fact, all you might need to say to the child is like, that's going to hurt you or that's hot. Or use some, you know, or, or some kind of thing like that, and often they will automatically respond because the emotion coming from you now is not one of fear but of love. See, a lot of times, every when we're bringing up children, we're judging things from the error all the time. We often don't know what is going to happen once we get into a state of truth because we're continuously judging things from the error. Many of us assume that it's not practical to do it this way because we're saying, well, "I'm full of this fear." And they're now sticking the thing in the socket, like this is a real practical situation, right? And it's dangerous for them. Well, obviously, you could go and choose to get these little plugs, couldn't you, and plug in the socket? Or you could choose to put the sockets up, like, out of reach of a two-year-old child. And it's interesting that hardly any houses are designed like that, which is an interesting thing in itself. And why would that be the case? Well, obviously, some emotions that the designers have about, you know, not caring about children and so forth. But all of those things could all be achieved. But at the end of the day, the fear in me is going to generate a situation where the child confronts that fear through an action. And that action might be, you know, they pull out the safety socket and push in their knife, or they go outside and walk across the road, or, you know, any kind of a number of things can happen to trigger this fear that's inside of myself. If I deal with that fear inside of myself, the law of attraction is such that even, like firstly, even if I deal with the fear, there's a high likelihood that the event will never occur. Secondly, if the event does occur, I won't, I'm not afraid of it anyway. I'm not actually afraid of my child passing. Does that make sense? I know, in fact, that the child is not my child. The child is God's child, and I have just created the two bodies for the child to incarnate into. So when I understand that at the emotional level, I won't be so afraid of what might happen to this child because I know that God is actually a far better parent than I am and can care for the child in any location. So all I'm afraid of really is my own fear of feeling the feeling of loss. And what I need to do is feel it. And ironically, when I feel it, it's a high likelihood my child will no longer trigger it. Does that make sense? And this is practical. This will work. I'm saying to you this will work. But most of the time we feel it's not practical because we're right in the situation. And I've been in this situation. There was a time in my childhood, in my son's childhood, Tristan I'm talking about, my firstborn son, where I belted him 21 times for putting a knife in a socket in a row. 
Right. So, I, what would emotion was in me? Lots of fear in me. There was lots of fear of dying, of loss, and all these other feelings that I've since released. What damage has that done to him? A huge amount of damage. Like, you know, he now feels he can't do whatever he wants a lot because of that one act of being punished for doing what he did. Does that make sense? And the only reason why I did it was because I was avoiding my own emotion. I was avoiding emotional response to what he was triggering in me. And he was just being this perfect little reflector. And he was two years old, oh, two and a half years old when he did it. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yeah. So, so when you allow the fear inside of you and connect to that fear of, I'm afraid of losing my child, you'll find actually there's a lot of beliefs in there that are untrue. There's a belief that firstly, if they die, they're dead. There's a feeling inside of you that that's the case, even though intellectually you know it to not be true. Spiritually, you've had all this spiritual work where you know here there's life after death and all those things. But when your child confronts death, bang, I'm feeling a different emotion here, like, whoa, this is a bad situation. Does that make sense? Straight away. So obviously there's an emotion inside of me causing me to still believe the untruth. So I'm believing the untruth that God doesn't care for my child. And I'm also believing the untruth that it's my child. And I'm believing the untruth that the child's not safe. Because the child's soul is always safe. Because it's got an everlasting existence. It's always safe. And I'm believing an untruth that actually the child's not triggering an emotion in me. Because the child's doing what they're doing to trigger an emotion in me. So I'm believing another untruth there. Can you see I'm believing so many untruths right at that one act? And I've been in the same situation where I had a long list of untruths to all work my way through. Then I got to the stage in when by the time my sons were teenagers where I could allow them to do anything they wanted. Anything at all. So naturally we had hardly, we had, well we had no arguments while my ch children, after my children were about 11. Because by then I'd worked through all of these emotions about trying to control them, fear of what they'd do, fear of how they'd, how I'd feel about what they do, fear about them pulling down me in some way, fear about how I would look as a parent to other people, fear about all sorts of things that I had to work my way through. And once I worked my way through that, I allowed my children their free will right across the board. So I never told them when to come home, I never told them what girl to stay away from or you know, what boy to stay away from or any of those kind of things. I never told them how they should drive their car or any of those things, because they have free will. And ironically, because of that lack of projection coming from myself, the majority of the time they actually made the wisest possible choice for themselves. Now if there was this projection coming from myself, the majority of the time they would have made a choice to trigger my emotion, which often would be quite the opposite. So very important to understand the law of attraction when we've when we're got children. Jen, up there, thanks. So this is a law of free will we're still discussing, but you can see how it impacts on their day-to-day -day life a lot. So could I um, talk to the child about the consequences? Certainly. Say to them, now if you stick that in the PowerPoint, it's really, really going to hurt, but also at the same time realise that I have a fear that I need to process but what if the child just goes straight back and does it again? That's still because I haven't dealt with it completely. Yep. But I could explain to them the consequences yes. of an action. Yes, always. Um, don't do what I did, which is give them pain for a potential consequence that may never happen. Because all that does is create lots of fear in them. So that, you know, that's a very damaging thing to do to the child. But certainly discuss with the child. But remember that at this age too, like the child is just reflecting your denied emotions. Even you just understanding that it's actually my fear that's creating this particular issue, my fear of loss, is going to actually probably change the event. Even just me getting into this place of understanding. The problem for most of us is when our child's in a dangerous situation, we generally don't allow ourselves to feel our own terror or fear. We go straight away and change the situation. And so the vent that's triggering emotion in me gets overlooked. 
And so that event that's triggered an emotion in me is going to have to happen again in order for me to actually truly deal with the underlying cause. Does that make sense? Yep. And up the back. There and then down. And Mike will need to be right up to be on, I think. No, it's still on. Um, is it right up? Green light's on? Is that better? That's spot on. Yeah. I, um, my daughter was kicking a ball around the window and I said to her, um, don't kick it because it could break the window. And I explained quite a lot. And then she said, no, I'm, I'll be okay. And I said, if you break the window, you'll have to pay for it. She broke the window and I said, you have to pay for it, which she did. And then I thought, well, the reason why she broke the window was um, I was in great fear of paying for the window myself. So I said to her, um, okay, it's my law of attraction because I'm the one worried about the broken window. I'll pay for the window. Right. But I'm not sure if that's correct now. I was always wondering, should I ask her to pay it or should I be paying for it? Um, right the way up till you paid for the window, everything was running fine. <laughs> But when you paid for the window, you took away the consequences yeah. of her creation from her. Does that make sense? Well, that's why I asked her to pay for the window because I knew it would be quite a lot for her to pay. But then I thought, well, I haven't dealt with this fear of not having money and, True. and, and um, losing some more money on a window, which I told her not to kick the ball around. But that was the causal emotion you were avoiding when you asked her to not kick the ball around. Can you see what I'm saying? Yeah. And you need to still deal with that causal emotion. Yeah. So, see, when we say to our child, we, we say to our child a potential consequence of their action, you told the child that they were going to, you know, perhaps break a window. They say, no, 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 I'm right. Bang, you know. Then, then when we take away the consequence of that action, we're not allowing them to see the results of their own creation. They, they were warned and they still have the results of their own creation. But ironically, at the same time, we're not seeing the results of our own creation. And that is, there was an emotion in you at the time of a fear of a lack of money that, that caused you to worry about the act. Now, if you'd dealt with the fear of lack of money, the window may not have been broken. Well, I say may not because the child still has an emotion that it feels it can thwart law, and that particular emotion might create the thing about the window breaking, and you would need to deal with that particular issue as you attempted to do, but without buying the window for the child. So at this stage, it's like um, uh, do she should be really responsible for paying for the window and I should be responsible for the causal feeling of it. Yeah, and so you might make a deal with it. 50-50. Yeah, we'll go 50-50 because we both created that particular problem. <laughs> so this is where it's about taking responsibility for your own part in the creation. So be fair about that as well. Understand that if you don't deal with an underlying causal emotion, then you are certainly going to create a law of attraction with your child that brings that emotion to you that you need to experience. But your child has the free will of their own. What we're trying to do is teach them free will. What is free will? I'm allowed to do anything I want that's harmonious or disharmonious with love, but there is a consequence to everything I do. Right? That's, that's the law of compensation. So I'm trying to teach them the law of free will, law of compensation and all these laws of God. In fact, the truth is that our only role as parents is to actually teach our children what we have learned about God's laws. That's the only thing we ever need to do. We don't need to do anything else with our children. We don't even need to be responsible for what they do with that. We just need to do it as best as we can with what we have learned about those laws. Um, I'm wondering hey. about. Oh, Up nice, yeah. guys. Oh, I'm wondering about. Like with Callum this week, we've been having lots of arguments, yeah. um, showing me all my male anger. But for his actions, I have grounded him for the way he's spoken. Like I'm still trying to deal with my anger, also. Yeah. But am I being unloving by giving him consequences for his actions? Like well, I took off a phone that he so loves. You know the things like instead of hitting or smacking or whatever, I have actually taken things that I've given him. Did you punish yourself for the consequence of your action? Sorry? 
Did you punish yourself? For I the felt guilty for it, yeah, because <laughs> he, he, called me, he called me an Indian giver. <laughs> right. He, yeah, so I'm, I'm starting to see everything they're saying. I don't challenge them on it. I'm actually listening to because they're honestly telling me exactly what I'm doing wrong. Yeah, let's look at interaction. The child's a male again, <laughs> right? Yeah. Mum's, mum's saying that the male is treating me disrespectfully. Yeah. All right, so I'm disrespected by men is my causal emotion. Yeah. All right. And so what does the child do? Just reflects that straight back at me because a male child reflects it straight back at me. Now, if I punish the male child for that, who actually created it? Me. You? Yeah. Yeah. So can you see that's quite an unjust action? It is, but... But? <laughs> but yes. you still want to punish the child for being disrespectful. So what's his, what's his compensation for treating me? Well, if you get rid of the cause within yourself and just see whether he's still treating you disrespectfully, mm -hmm. then you will notice that it's actually inside of him and you'll need to correct it. But at the moment, you're not dealing with the cause, so how can you expect him to? No, I know. Does that make sense? It's yeah, like I I'm punishing my son for not dealing with the cause within himself, but I'm not dealing with the cause within me. Is that sound very fair to you? No, it doesn't. Because I'm really punishing the son for doing what I personally am actually doing. And so this is something we do as parents, like I've done this hundreds of times, right? Mm. We do this as parents all the time. We punish our child for the reflection of the emotion towards ourselves as a parent, but our child is just reflecting your own denied emotion. And it's a very important thing to understand that... The child has, if I start punishing the child for reflecting the my creation, not a, I've now damaged their free will. Right? They're allowed to do that. Remember I said right at the start, the law of free wills, I'm allowed to do anything that's harmonious or disharmonious with love. My child being disrespecting to me is disharmonious with love. I agree. But my child's allowed to do that. They're allowed to. Does that make sense? From God's perspective, they're allowed to. What I need to do first is deal with the emotion that created it in the child. Once I deal with that, then you might firstly find that they no longer do that. But secondly, if I don't do if I if I deal with that, I will never feel disrespected by my child, even if my my child attempts to treat me disrespectfully. And every time they attempt to treat me disrespectfully, I will do something about it inside of myself and I'll do something about my environment about it. In other words, I can't be controlled by my child treating me disrespectfully. I can only believe I'm being controlled by my child treating disrespectfully from an emotional perspective. How are you? I was just going to say the most loving thing I can do for myself in that situation is actually to deal with my causal emotion. Exactly. And that, that is also, ironically, the most loving thing you're going to be doing for your child. right? But when I punish my child for an emotion that I myself am not releasing, I am actually also quite a lot damaging my child. Because when you think about it, how unfair is that? I've created the emotion, in my, the reflection of the emotion in my child, and then I go ahead and punish them for it. Now, I can guarantee to you, if like... Many of you feel still, with regard to this stuff between parents and children, that what I'm saying is not practical at all. But I can, I can guarantee to you, if you put it into practice, you will find that every single causal emotion that's still in you is being reflected at every single moment by your child. And you will find once you own that, your relationship not only with your child will, will just change remarkably, but also you will be greatly assisted to actually feel your own causal emotions. Because at the moment, many of us still blame our child for their response to us, when in reality, it's our own personal denied emotion that creates this response. Now, when we let the emotion pass right through us, you will notice a big difference. You will notice it. And this is like I said, with my own sons, I've done both things. I've done it the normal way, you know, 
that we're taught to bring up children nowadays, although the smacking part of it, I probably went excess of the normal way nowadays. So I've gone right from one extreme, if you like, from corporal punishment extreme, right to another extreme of just doing anything they want and, and not valuing myself in the process. And then I've come back to this midpoint where I value and love myself and my own free will, and I also value and love my sons and their free will. Does that make sense? And in that point, you cannot be manipulated and your, your, son, you know, your children will not even feel an emotion from you that you can be manipulated and so they will not manipulate you because they will not feel that emotion that needs to be reflected by them. God created it like this so that you can learn through this pain that you feel in your relationship with your children that you can learn when you're breaking the law. Remember I said in the introductory session of God's laws, any time I'm in pain, I am breaking, I am breaking a law. Any time I'm in pain, I am breaking the law. Not somebody else, I am. So that's a very important thing to remember. When you understand that emotionally, you will find things around you change very, very rapidly. So, and, and I've done both of the, I've done all of these things in between in my life. And so I understand how it must feel confusing to hear some of these things at times. But trust me, when you start actually doing it this way, you'll find things will change very rapidly in your relationship with your children. Um, I don't, what, what was your wife or their mother doing in that situation? What I'm asking you is, what she if agreed. one parent's dealing with it and the other parent isn't? Ah, yes, so impact, you're asking... impact the children? Yep. The parent who has the interaction with the child is what the child is reflecting in return. So mother and my, parent, my, my male child is yelling at me but never yells at his father, then it's the mother that has the issue with the child. Does that make sense? If I'm a male child and I've got a father and I'm feeling really surly and abusive with my father, then it's the father that's got an issue with masculinity or with himself or with me. Does that make sense? So in every single interaction, a child will reflect exactly towards the person that they're dealing with, towards the parents that they're connecting with at any one time. That's what happens with the child. And this is, and obviously it gets a bit more complicated if there's grandparents in the home or so forth, right? So if there's a grandparent in the home then the ch and the child's yelling at the granddad but not yelling at dad, then there's a specific emotion that granddad has towards the child that the child is reflecting back to granddad. Does that make sense? If grandma has an emotion with the child but mum doesn't and the child's reflecting something at grandma, then it's grandma that has the issue with the child and the child is just reflecting that issue. Does that make sense? So it just depends which person specifically. In a lot of cases, it will be more than one person. So if there's two males in the household and the child's reflecting emotions to both of those males, then I've got to look at the fact of what, as a father, what emotions do I have towards me as men? And the mother would have to look at what emotions does she have towards men that might create this particular interaction. So if your wife, if you dealt with the emotion of putting the knife into the socket and your wife hadn't, is there still that opportunity for that child to um, hurt itself or does your... Certainly. Certainly. And, and uh, instead of doing it with me around, it will do it with my wife around. So this is why sometimes you'll notice that in a, in a family situation, sometimes the child seems to really play up with one parent but not with the other. You, you notice that? Like sometimes a child plays up with mum or dad under certain circumstances. And trust me, even the circumstance matters, right? Because in that circumstance there's an emotion that I'm denying. Let's say I'm the mum and the circumstance is actually I've got a visitor around. And the child always plays up when I've got a visitor around, right? And I'm the mum and the child happens to be my son, right? I need to look at what emotions might be happening inside of me towards men, causing trouble with me and my relationships with other women. I might have to look at an emotion that's to do with men controlling me in my relationships with other women. I might have to look at an emotion 
Do you see where it's leading? Looking at inside of myself what emotions might be there that would cause this interaction to occur. Every single situation is a law of attraction event. And with our children, they are perfectly reflecting every single thing within ourselves. Okay. Now, I don't want to cover too much more with the family situation things, because there's a lot of laws that we want to cover. Um, does everyone understand, if I'm on the divine love path, I will deal with these issues emotionally. I won't try and act differently without dealing with the emotion emotionally. Right? I won't try to make myself do something. I will deal with the underlying reason why I'm not doing it. When I deal with the underlying reason, that's when everything starts to change. Karen? I'm, I'm, I've always assumed that if something is happening, if I don't have an emotional reaction to it, then it's somebody else's issue. But is it possible that I'm numbing myself to an emotional reaction? Yes, very much so. So let's say an event is happening around me and it seems to continually happen around me, but I don't seem to have any emotional response to it, but this event continues to happen around me, then there's a high likelihood I'm right, I'm right up in the intellectual space where I'm not even acknowledging that I actually have an emotion about it, and in reality I do have an emotion about it that I'm covering over quite strongly. So that's also a possibility. And so it's important for you to always look at that possibility. What am I even suppressing intellectually in this situation. All right. But let's get back to the laws, right? the law of free will. Does everyone understand with all of these laws, I've got two options of dealing with them. I can go down the path of not breaking them on an intellectual way, right? or I can go down the path of getting to the causal emotion and desire that created it. I can do either. Now. One way is called the natural love way. The natural love way, I will use my intellect to actually strive to make my life better. And to be frank with you, you will always be striving if you do that because your soul is still creating something quite different. Or I can get to my soul's emotions and desires and release the ones that are disharmonious with love and you'll find the instant that you do that, your life will change in that particular situation. All right. And if you can do that at the causal, right, right, and release the causal emotion completely, you'll find your life will never be the same again. And you won't have to intellectually try to do things one after the other all the time. Does everyone follow that? So it's really important to understand that difference. All right, what's the next law? Now it's connected, isn't it? Don't you think? The law of passion and desire. So let's uh, all right. So what are we saying here? What we're saying is that I am the most powerful creator when I am operating in my desires completely. That's what I'm saying. So that's the law of desire. If I And remember, desire is about asking. Remember we talked about asking. Asking isn't something that occurs in your head either. It occurs in your emotions. What do I feel I want? Not what do I think I want? This is why for many people, when they hear about the law of attraction, you know, like the secret style, law of attraction, they try doing all these intellectual things and then they still can't create what they want. Because at the soul level, there's a whole different emotion creating what they want. So the law of desire is I'm allowed to create and I can create anything I want. Ask and you shall receive. Now, how many times do we break that? Well, quite a lot. Every single time you ask for something and don't believe you're going to get it, you break the law. Because the feeling, the emotion in you is, I'm not going to get that, that's not going to happen for me, and off it goes, right? Straight away, you're breaking the law. But also, every single time you allow another person in your life to stop you from doing what you desire, you break the law. And lots of people break the law this way. Like, how many of us work in a place that we don't like. 
we're breaking the law of desire. Remember, every time I break the law, the consequence is pain. So you will feel a painful emotion inside of yourself when you do not allow yourself to follow your passions and desires. Now remember, because of the law of free will, you're allowed to have any desires you want and they can even be out of harmony with love, if that's what you want. But if they were in harmony with love, you would actually prevent yourself from actually acting upon that desire if they were out of, sorry, out of harmony with love. So if my desires were out of harmony with love, I would actually look at the underlying emotional reason inside of myself as to why it's out of harmony with love, and I would deal with that emotion. Once I dealt with that emotion, what would I feel? I would feel only feelings that are harmonious with love, and then I can have any desire I want in those feelings. So this is a very powerful law to experiment with with yourself. Every time you deny this law for yourself, you will harm yourself. Ironically too, every time you deny this law for yourself, you harm everyone around you. Because even with your children, every time you don't act in your desire, you are teaching your child to not act in their desire. So they grow up thinking that desires can't be acted upon either. It's not practical you know, in, in the environment we live in and so forth. And that creates their reality. So they'll grow up, no, 15, 16, they badly want a horse, but no, nah, it's not going to happen. You know, my desires never come true. But if the child is allowed to have its desire, they'll find if they badly want a horse, the world, the universe, will conspire to bring them exactly what they desire, just like the universe will conspire to bring you exactly what you desire. But remember, the law of desire always operates upon the soul. It doesn't act upon what you think you want. It acts upon what is going on inside of yourself. So if my emotion inside of me is that oh, I'm just totally unworthy to get anything I want, what's my law of desire? How that's, how's that going to work? I'm going to get nothing that I want. In order to trigger that soul-based emotion, the law of attraction will trigger that emotion. When I release that emotion, I will then get exactly what I want. Everything is based upon the soul, which are the emotions, passions and desires operating within you. Now, you can put that into practice and experiment with that. Every time you experiment with that, you'll find that desire is one of the most powerful things you can develop. So, the divine love path is not just about dealing with negative emotions, right? It's also about learning to exercise your positive desires yeah, and really follow them completely. You'll be surprised when you start doing it that oftentimes you have no idea what desires you actually have. Like I went through this period in my own life where I sat down and um, I, I went along to a, a guy who was helping me work through emotions and he asked me to do an exercise. And the exercise was that I was, had to list all of my passions. And I went back the next week with, with a blank page because I didn't really know what they were. Right? And there was a heap of emotions in that. And I was talking last week uh, at one of our seminars we did at uh, Armadale to a, to, a fellow, to, a, to a couple of fellows after the group. And they come up to me and said, you know, I've been seeking... One of the men were, were, was in his 60s and he's come up and said, you know, I've been seeking to know what my life's purpose is for the last 60 years and I still don't know what it is. And I said to him, actually, your problem isn't not knowing what your life purpose is. The problem is that you were never allowed to have one when you were little. You were never allowed to have a desire when you were little. And as soon as I said that, he just started crying. And he could feel that immediate emotion of never being able to have a desire. Now, this man had spent all of his money over the last 60 years looking for what his passion was and ending up really, really frustrated. But actually, he couldn't find his passion because there was this emotion in him, in the soul, that you're not allowed to have your passion. And if that emotion's in your soul, at the end, unless that comes out of your soul, you're going to live the rest of your life thinking that you don't know what you feel and don't know what you desire. Just that one emotion which would have entered him when he was very little, 
told, you know, by mum or dad telling him that he's not allowed to do those things. Does that make sense? Okay. So law of desire and passion, really important. Okay. Notice there's a lot of notes in each section that you might want to check up on later because there's a lot of things I'm not covering in this because I do want to get through them all. All right. What's the next law? All right. So the law of cause and effect is basically what I sow, I reap. In other words, I am responsible for every single thing that's happening in my life right now. Every single thing. Now there's a huge emotional rejection of that for most people. Most people believe that other people are responsible for these negative things that other people say and do towards me. Right? So if I'm having anger projected to me, ah, oh, that's their problem. It's not actually. It's your issue. Now that doesn't mean that you have anger in you. What it might mean is that you have fear in you that attracts their anger. Or you have a feeling of being controlled by people's anger that you need to release. Or you have a feeling that you're, that you're willing to be manipulated because of you're afraid of their violence that's in you. That might be another feeling that's in you. But the law of cause and effect is always saying, I am responsible for everything that's going on in my life. Now this is as an adult. I am responsible for all of these different things that I am creating and causing. Now, when I love myself, when I feel love towards myself, I will honour that law. Now, the way that I honour it is by understanding that it's pointless for me to try to change an effect when I've got an emotional cause still happening inside of me. I'm on a wild goose chase when I'm doing that, basically. You know, you've seen the dog chasing its tail, and it's quite amusing, but our lives don't feel very amusing when it feels like we're chasing our tail, does it? It's like going around and around and around. And that's because oftentimes we're not respecting this law. What we're doing is we're trying to change the effect of what our soul is creating. And we're not changing the cause. And so our soul goes on creating exactly the thing that we're trying to change. And we try all of our life. And many of us feel exhausted in our life because we still feel like we're trying to change things, trying to change things, trying to make things better. Things might slowly get better, but it just seems like, wow, like how much effort to make just one little change in my life. And the reason why that's happening is because I don't understand that there's the emotional, the soul-based cause within me that's creating my life. And unless I'm willing to deal with that soul-based cause in me, I'm not loving myself. So what do we do instead of that? We focus on the effect. How do we focus on the effect? Somebody gets angry and upset with me, so what do I do? Get angry and upset back with them, trying to prevent them or control them from getting angry with me. All I'm doing is addressing the effect. So what's going to happen? I'm going to have an argument next week and an argument next month and an argument next year in the same way. So like this happens a lot in our family with our children. One of the children always wants to argue with me. Why? Because I'm not dealing with the... Make sense? As soon as I deal with the cause, that child's going to stop arguing with me. But instead, what do we try to do? We try to punish the child for arguing with me. We give them little, you know, demerit things that they have to do, whatever that is. And in the end, what are we doing? We're just dealing with the effect and we are already recreating the cause as we're doing that. Right? Now, when I stop doing that, what happens? All of a sudden, my life changes. Because once I deal with the cause, once I focus on the cause, and even just to focus on the cause is, yes, I created it. That, that's the start of focusing on the cause. That's the first point you've got to get to, focusing on the cause. Just yes, an acknowledgement. Yes, I've created everything in my life. Every single disease I've got in my body, that was my, that's my creation. It's a suppressed emotion in me that I'm not releasing. There's something going on inside of me that I'm not do dealing with. That's the cause. Every time I deny that one truth, right, and we're still, some of us who are willing to deny that one truth even right now, 
but every time I deny that truth, I am going to be left dealing with the effects of these causes over and over and over and over and over again, and you're going to get very exhausted until you understand what is the creator of them. So it's far better to understand what is creating them than it is to deal with the effect. Now you look at every law that mankind creates. Generally, what does it do? Deals with effects. So we've got all these speeding laws. We've got all these fines for breaking the law, which is just dealing with the effect. It doesn't deal with the emotional reason. You look at the drunk driver laws. How many people still drive with alcohol? Like, there's, there's millions in Australia doing it every week. But there's a whole group of laws that are meant to stop it. Are they stopping it? No. Why? Because the laws only deal with the effect. What's the cause? Why does a person want to get drunk for a start? And then why do they want to get drunk and then drive? Which is another set of conditions, emotional conditions within them. If you start addressing the emotional cause, if the law addressed the cause, we'd have far less drunk drivers on the road and far less accidents and injuries and deaths due to drunk driving. But that doesn't happen. What we do generally in the world today is we just deal with the effect. So what we do is we make another law. So, you know, you see law after law after law being created, one after the other, after the other. After. None of us even know how many there are anymore. Like, I, I can't even remember 20 of them, like, in this country. Like, I don't know how you would go remembering them, particularly how they're stated. Like, oh, I'm not allowed to drive on the wrong side of the road. That's a fairly obvious one to me. <laughs> I know that one. <laughs> you know? When there's a sign there that says 100, that means I go 100. But nobody in Queensland seems to obey that one. <laughs> it's funny, when we were driving in New South Wales last week, Everyone in New South Wales seems to obey that one. And it's all because of the fear of the effect. Because in New South Wales, the fines are a bit higher, there's more speed cameras all checking you all the time, and the police all have speed cameras going back and forth all the time. And so there's a lot more presence that causes people to slow down. So we noticed when we went into New South Wales, all of a sudden everyone was doing the speed limit rather than having people whoosh past while you're doing the speed limit. And the, in the end, though, none of these laws really deal with the cause. What's the reason why I want to speed? And why would, what would be the reason why I want to do it that's dangerous in a manner to other people? Then there's got to be something going on there, doesn't there? Inside of me emotionally. Let's address the emotion. Can you see how it works? If I address the emotion, then I'm loving myself. If I love myself... I will always focus on the emotional cause within myself of this creation. If I don't love myself, I will try to plan and schedule my life to get around it. And you know, when we do that, all we finish up doing is getting around our fears, you know, and avoiding our fears. But our fears are in us, and so they're going to create another situation that creates this fear. This is why we have lots of accidents in our life. There was one lady I knew who had 22 accidents in the space of three years. Every time avoiding the emotion that created the accident for her. And I, I asked her to just place herself for a moment in one of those accidents in her mind and in her imagination and then allow whatever feelings to come up. And she felt absolutely terrified. And it was this terror of personal hurt that was creating every accident that she was still avoiding. And so she kept creating more accident, creating another accident, creating another accident. And once she deals with that emotion, she'll find that, that those events will not occur anymore. It's just that simple. So what, what did she do instead? You know, get a bigger car so it's safer, put a bull bar on the front so that it, like somebody else gets hurt instead of me, and so forth and so forth. But in the end, if you don't deal with the underlying cause, another accident will happen. In her case, just kept happening, 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 until she deals with the cause. All right. Can you see how that relates to love of self? 
Because if I'm dealing with just the effect of any of my actions, can you see that I'm just going to get tired, exhausted? That's not loving myself. You can see this happening all the time too when other people want you to deal with effects rather than causes. If you love yourself, you won't get drawn into that. All right? So to give you an example, let's say you've got a son, you're, you're maybe in your 50s or 60s, you've got a son who's in his 20s or 30s, and he's pretty reckless with money. And every time he spends the last of his funds, he comes to you for a bailout. All right? Now, if I really loved myself, would I do that? No, I wouldn't. And remember, a sacrifice of myself in order to love another is not loving to myself or the other either. So if I bailed him out and sacrificed my feeling in the process, then that's not loving either. So what do I need to do? I need to look at the cause within me of why he keeps asking and why I keep giving him the money. Because there's an emotional cause that's probably related to guilt. Guilt that I've somehow damaged their childhood through their upbringing or something like that. I deal with that emotion. He may or may not deal with the cause within him, but I've at least dealt with the cause within me. And then when he comes to me for the funds, I could focus on, son, why are you creating this? You create this time after time after time. If I just give you the funds, what am I doing? Besides being unloving to myself, I'm actually being unloving to you. I'm actually letting you keep create the same thing without feeling the effects of your creation. Does God do that? No. God always has you feel the effects of what you create. All of God's laws are loving. And this is why cause is so important to deal with. Does that make sense? Just see if we can have the mic over there. Yes. Okay. AJ, twice this year I've had hoses burst inside my house and my house flood. So what am I possibly doing that I'm attracting that? Like I really don't want my furniture underwater for a third time. So the question, with any event that happens to us through our law of attraction, we've got to actually look at the emotions that are created from the event. Because the emotions that are created from the event are usually highly connected to the causal emotion within us. So what do you feel when that event occurs? Barry said wet behind the ears. <laughs> <laughs> wet behind the ears, yeah. Um, a huge amount of emotion. Um, so let, let, let yourself, rather than maybe listing them here, yep. let yourself write down all the emotions you feel from that event. When you let yourself release those emotions and experience them properly, you'll find you won't cause that event anymore. Does that make sense to you? Like, yeah. So a lot, of, a lot of times what we do is we feel so stressed out by the event that we don't think to actually feel our emotions about the event. What we do instead is we rapidly go around cleaning up our house, right? <laughs> feeling all these emotions which we're trying to shove down while we're cleaning up our house, right? So I'm not saying don't clean up your house. I'm saying feel your emotions while you're doing it. So have a good bowl while you're doing it and all these other emotions that come up, let yourself feel all of them. And then always try to ask yourself the question, and this is where prayer is really important. Pray to God for the answer as to what inside of you is a childhood emotion that causes you to feel this, whatever it is that's being created. There will always be some denied childhood emotion that created the event and allow yourself to get there. But the fastest way to allow yourself to get there is to just feel the emotion in the present situation. right? Oftentimes what we do instead of doing that is instead of feeling that emotion in the present situation, we try to fix that emotion in the present situation. Right? We don't like our house looking dirty and untidy, so we fix that up. We want the plumber to come straight away, so we ring him up straight away and get him to do the work. And if he can't come straight away, we get angry with him. Don't you realise this is an emergency? And off we go with that. Do you know what I mean? And all the time what we're doing is just trying to fix things that are effects rather than deal with the underlying emotional reason inside of ourselves. Now, I've given you plenty of examples in the past where I've done that and all of a sudden everything around me has got fixed without me having to do anything physically for it. Does that make sense? And that will happen every single time you deal with the causal emotion. If you don't deal with the causal emotion, then you will always be dealing with the effects every time. 
So allow yourself to make the list. So every time an event happens and you don't know what the cause is, make a list of what you feel about that. What do you feel about your house being flooded? What particular areas of your house got flooded? Right? Even that's going to have an effect on, you know, sometimes you find your most precious painting got wet and the other thing that you didn't really care for was dry. Right? We were just recently, um, bringing up a different situation, we were recently with a couple who own a sheep and cattle property down south. And they breed these stud bulls for breed, to give to other breeders. And uh, the bull that's the best bull is always the bull who plays up. And, and they couldn't understand why. What's going on? Why is it only ever the bull that I want to be the best one, that is the best one, and I want to be the show bull, and I've got to put him aside because he's... Because in the, in the, a show ball, as soon as it demonstrates any aggressiveness, it's automatically disqualified from a show. Right? So what's causing this particular ball to do these particular things? And we talked about all of the emotional interplay that was happening between the husband and wife and between the husband and one of his workers that was actually making the ball play up. And he's been experimenting, he's going to be experimenting with that now, and working through his emotions about it. Because all the bull's doing is just reflecting his emotions. Right? You try this with your own cat, your own dog. You know, it will happen all the time too. So look at every event inside that happens. If you don't know what the emotion is, then probably you're not feeling right at that moment. Because usually when a trigger event occurs, if you're not in an emotion, you're in a denial state anyway. And then secondly, allow yourself to sit down and start writing down at least a little bit of what you think you feel. Start trying to dig a bit deeper into the emotions. And you'll find in this case that there'll be a, quite a list of emotions that you feel about it, particularly about it happening a second time. And let yourself feel those emotions now instead of trying to skip out of them and go back to fixing the problem. And behind you too, there's... Oh, no, you'll need a microphone. You have to use a microphone because we're recording it. Thank you, AJ. I feel that this also becomes um, genetically down the line, it's carried on down the line in, within the cellular structure. So if it's not healed or released in this generation, it can be in the other. And I consistently see it in Aboriginal community from their past traumas. It is actually within the cellular structure. So it can actually go back further than even if they were treated very well in this lifetime. What's your... Feelings on um, that. I don't believe it's the cellular structure, but I can, I can, yeah, I'll, let me show you what it is. I've talked about this question before, but here's our soul. Our soul has an emotion in it. These emotions came from, where did they come from? Generally, from the soul of our parent. So the parent's soul in some case, right? Where they had an emotion, and their denial of that emotion created a subsequent emotion in myself. It doesn't mean it's the same emotion because an emotion of a denial of something in the parent can, can create the opposite emotion. Does that make sense? Now, every time... What, so what happens is as soon as I incarnate, as soon as I become present in the physical, all of my parents' denied emotions are now imposed upon me, which now means my soul has all of those emotions inside of it. Now, on top of that, my grandparents' soul probably has similar emotions that they pass down to their parents, and so forth and so forth back generationally. Does that make sense? Now, what's happening is that sometimes my grandparent might have passed. Now, if my grandparents pass and they still feel an affinity to me, they're a spirit who's surrounding me. So they might then have that same emotion and their grandparent might have the same emotion and if they haven't moved on, their grandparent might have the same emotion and so forth, right the way back generationally. So not only do I have now my own emotions, but I have all of my emotions created by my events in my life that were denied in my environment, created all the way back generationally. And that imposes itself upon my soul. And because my soul is connected to my spirit body and my physical body, right? So the spirit body and physical body. Because my soul is connected to that, every single emotion that I have that's unhealed within myself 
creates a physical problem in both of those bodies, which then becomes cellular. Does that make sense? So the key is with cellular memory, what we need to do is understand where it's coming from. Where it's coming from is the soul's denied emotion that creates damages in these bodies. Now, unfortunately, we have another part of this, and that is that there might be a spirit who's our friend or thinks they're our friend, who's connected to me through my spirit body. And they might have some emotions which are very similar to my emotions projecting at me as well. And so their emotions projected through these bodies will create different errors in these bodies. So this is why sometimes you can actually expel a spirit from a person's body and instantly their physical body heals. When I say instantly, I mean instantly in many cases, like instantly. They disconnect from the person on the earth, their physical body straight away has function. But there is still the emotion which can create another attraction of a spirit there that I'd need to deal with. So it's the emotion that causes all attractions. So can you see how like cellular memory type ideas are sort of a simplification, yeah. Really what everything's happening through the soul affecting the spirit bodies, whether that soul be the multi-generations of our parents or friends in the spirit world who are connecting to us. If you can talk into the mic if you've still got it, because we can't hear it on the tape otherwise. The spirit can affect the soul as well. The actual spirit, like if we're alive, we have a spirit. The spirits are... All, the, and vice versa. I'm talking about the spirit friends in the spirit world. Yeah. All of them are always affecting our soul. Yeah. And the reason why is because they are just like any other person on earth. Every one of you here today is affecting each other's soul in some way. Mm -hmm. All your denied emotion is getting reflected out into the, into the audience, which other people are feeling and all of your felt emotion you are owning, and so it's not getting reflected out, but it does have an impact on others. When you follow your desire, it has an impact on others. It's impossible for any of us to not be affected, if we really are loving, in order to be not be affected in some way by others. It's our response emotional to it that determines how clear we are inside of ourselves. So I said last week to a group, what I do myself is I allow myself to feel all of my emotions about what's getting passed into me. So the last few weeks I've been getting lots and lots of rage from people on earth and in the spirit world, and I'm just letting it wash through me. And, it, and whatever is inside of me, and the emotion inside of me is of emotion of fear, gets triggered, so I go into trembling about it. Does that make sense? And once I release that emotion and it's gone, people can project that emotion at me, and I will no longer feel that emotional response of fear inside of me. So what you're actually saying is even if you clear the spirit, you need to clear the soul of the emotions and, vi and vice versa, not just clearing the emotions and forgetting versa. it, not vice versa. No, okay. because when you clear the emotion in the soul, your spirit and material bodies will automatically clear. Okay. Because remember, your soul is what drives all of your, your whole physiological structure is driven and, and controlled by the condition of your soul. And this, by the way, there's some spirits who are also prompting your question. So yes, there's some other very things. Much, I, of course. <laughs> yeah. So what I'd like to do is address some of their questions because yes. they are asking some additional questions. Thank you. The additional questions they're asking are, um, what about in the spirit world? How does it work there? And the way that it works there is exactly the same as it works here on Earth, in that our soul's emotion guides the condition of our spirit body. So many of the spirits who are asking this question have a very poor spirit body. They're very sickly looking spirit bodies. And they thought when they passed over into the spirit world that they'd actually have good looking spirit bodies. And they're finding actually that they've got bad looking spirit bodies, even worse looking bodies than they had when they were on earth. And so they need to understand that it's because of an emotional reason within themselves. And when they release the causal emotions within their soul, their spirit body's look will automatically get better. And you can... Yeah, no, that's all right. So then, if I work on myself, because I'm working so closely with some of these... Spirits? Um, yep. yep. If I work on myself to clear my soul, will I be clearing their spirit through that, through their soul of their spirit? You can't sort of clear an emotion for another person. However, what you can do 
is be in an open enough state where they feel allowed to clear their emotion. So, for example, if I have an emotion inside of myself where I'm angry with men, so this emotion exists inside of me, I'm angry with men. If a woman comes to me and she's also angry with men, she'll let herself feel angry with men around me. Does that make sense? But if I'm angry with men and I'm denying the underlying grief I feel about men, and the woman who's angry with men comes to me and she starts crying in front of me about how she feels hurt by men, I am going to automatically try to shut her down. That will happen before I even open my mouth. There will be an emotion coming from me of, no, you're not allowed to feel this grief. I don't want to feel my grief. You're not allowed to feel yours. And I'll do everything in my power right up to giving a big hug and saying, there, there, you don't have to feel this in order to stop the process from occurring. So the same applies when we're helping spirits. When I, if I'm in a state where I'm shutting down an emotion inside of myself, then I'm automatically preventing any person who's with me, whether I say it or not, it's immaterial, I'm automatically present, preventing any person who's with me from experiencing that emotion. So if I'm shutting down an emotion of grief within me, any spirit with me is, feel, is going to feel like they're not allowed to feel their grief. If I'm, already, if I'm shutting down an emotion of shame, sexual shame within me, any spirit who's around me will not be able to feel their sexual shame. They will feel like they're not, they can't talk about their own sexual shame. Does that make sense? Because of the emotion in me. So me getting rid of the emotions inside of me has a very powerful effect to everyone around me because everyone around me feels like they're allowed to do what they're allowed to do. This is why many of you in the past have come up to me, started saying a story that you've told yourself ten times before, but cry when you're telling me. Because I feel like you're allowed to cry. Does that make sense? Whereas you don't feel like you're allowed to cry, but when you're around somebody who feels like you're allowed to, you do. But if you're allowed around somebody who feels like you're not allowed to, what do you do then? You bury, bury it, push it down, suppress it, all the things you learnt to do when you were little. But hopefully that sort of explains what's going on. Yep, that's good. All right, what's the next law we want to cover? We've already covered a bit of it, haven't we? So this is to do with laws that govern the love of self, the law of attraction. All right. When I love myself, and by the way, the law of attraction is everything that comes to me is a result of my soul condition. I'm automatically creating, through my soul condition, everything in my life. Now, the majority of people don't even want to acknowledge that. So straight away, they're not loving themselves if they don't acknowledge that. You see, if you don't acknowledge one of the laws of God inside of yourself, that it's true, then straight away you're in a state of denying your own creations, which is straight away, straight away a state of denying yourself, and every time you deny yourself, you're not loving yourself. So... The law of attraction is a real law. It's a tangible law. You can put it, in, and it is in action every single moment of your life. So let's look at the law of attraction. What would I do with the law of attraction if I loved myself? Well, if I love myself, I won't try to avoid intellectually the law of attraction. So in other words, I'm driving along in the car, somebody cuts me off, I swear at him and tell him he's a bastard or whatever, right? And then I, and then I don't own the emotion inside of myself. I've just projected the emotion at him. And then I tell myself, ah, you know, I just have a bit of a breathe, you know, a bit of a sort of a, you know, breathe to calm myself down. I get myself back into happy and away I go. Right? What have I just done? I have not loved myself. Because if I loved myself, what I would do is say, I would honour this law of attraction. This beautiful event happened to trigger an emotion inside of me, which was covered by my anger and rage initially. And I need to get beyond my anger and rage down into this other emotion that I felt. Oh, that other emotion. I start feeling that now, right? I start feeling this other emotion. Gee, that was dangerous. Gee, I could have lost my life there if I didn't have my wits about me. You know? Gee, he didn't respect me very much at all. He didn't even care I was there or not. In fact, now that I feel about it, it was like I wasn't there at all to him. <laughs> So what figure? I'm nothing, I'm useless. You know, these kind of feelings start coming up just from this one little event. Now, 
the beauty of the law of attraction is it exposes every single emotion inside of myself right at that particular instance that I'm denying. It's a fantastic law because it gives me this beautiful power to change. It gives me this power to identify everything within myself that needs to be changed and I can change it right in that instant. So someone I love is sick. I need to deal with the my law of attraction. What's going on inside of me? What feelings and emotions does it create inside of me? And I need to allow myself to work through those feelings and emotions. Someone I cared about died. What do I feel inside of myself? Work your way through those feelings. There's always causal emotion associated with all these events. What happens when my child reflects at me anger? Then there's my law of attraction. What's going on inside of me? I need to look at those things. What if my child is uncontrollably crying? What am I denying inside of me that has created this law of attraction? Can you see that if everything goes back to this, how much power it gives you to change? And isn't that the most loving thing for you? So if I really love myself, I will love my own law of attraction. I will just think it's beautiful. And I won't try to get around it. You know, we spend hours and hours, like I used to spend every night at least an hour or two. This is how I used to govern my life. Every hour before I go to bed, I would write down everything that I thought I was going to do tomorrow. And then I would write down everything that I thought might go wrong with what I wanted to do tomorrow. And then I'd write down what I would do to fix those things that would go wrong tomorrow as well. Right? And this was almost a religious practice that I had. So I was in a major state of terror and fear. Guaranteed? You can see that, right? So, so every time I did that, what was I doing? I was just trying to avoid my own law of attraction. You know, I could, I could have chucked all that out the window and just said, what happens tomorrow happens, and I'll just feel whatever is the result of what happens. And my life would have worked a lot better, I can guarantee you, because tomorrow many of the things that I wrote down did in fact actually, actually finish up happening, and I did have to finish, fix them up. And you know, most of the time I tried to fix them up and I still couldn't, because like many of us, we're just dealing with the effects. So all I was doing was dealing with the effects, trying to work around and plan and schedule my life in order to avoid my law of attraction. When you start doing it different to that, what happens is you love your law of attraction. You think, really, I'm a powerful creator, right? Everything that's happening to me is the result of my law of attraction because it needs to happen to me in order to have something inside of me dealt with. Right? So I would actually start dealing with that. Now, once I'm at a state where I've really loved that, my law of attraction will get me to the point where I've released all my causal emotion. And then, no matter what happens to me, uh, there will be no emotional effect on me, aside from love coming out of me. That's what will happen. When that happens, we're at one with God. If you've prayed for divine love and receiving divine love through the process then you'll be at one with God in that state. You see, my law of attraction, remember in the discussion about the law of attraction, I said the law of attraction is God's messenger of truth to you. It happens moment by moment by moment in your life. Every single thing that you attract into your life, God is giving you a message. Ah, there's this little emotion here. You notice that? So God's saying, see that little emotion there? You see that? See, that needs to come out of you in order to have a closer relationship with me. That emotion. You see that emotion? Oh, that emotion happened again. You see that? <laughs> oh, that emotion happened again. You see that? Yeah. That emotion still keeps happening. Oh, you've been going like that for 25 years, have you? That's how long you wanted to hold on to that emotion. Right? That's God's law of, that's the law of attraction, God's messenger of truth to you, telling you each little emotion that you're holding on to at any point in time. It's just so wonderful because you, it actually gives you the power to change your life quite markedly, this law. And yet most of us, I've talked to many of you, and you're petrified about your law of attraction. Can you see that being afraid of your own law of attraction just creates more law of attraction events? <laughs> right. So learn to love your law of attraction. It's a really powerful thing. Josh? Just a microphone. Uh, Josh, hold up your hand, mate, so someone could see you. That's it. I was just wondering, um, just say you're in some ca causal emotion, you just started connecting to it and you're crying, and then I've, I've just been wondering in the last couple of weeks, 
because there's this law of uh, repentance, you, you've said before you'll be crying for four hours in a day. Is what's happening there? Like, I can't understand why God doesn't, if you're connecting with the, the causal emotion, why isn't that dealt with in an instant? If, if God is, you know, has the power to do that, why wouldn't that? And why would you need to be crying for four hours? Because I'm finding with myself, when I'm in those emotions, it's like there's, like you've said before, different facets and you'll be moving from, you don't know whether it is a causal emotion or not, but you'll be moving from one thing and then your intellect will be saying, I'm no good, I've never been good. And then you'll just suddenly, you know, that be three seconds of a big, oh, coming out and yeah. then you go to the next thing and then yeah. it'll be like slightly different. So what, what's happening there, so here's you as the person, right? So if you could think of emotion passing through you initially. So when you were a child, emotions should have been allowed to pass through you, right? And then what happened with your parents and interactions with the environment, you know, school and all these other things, different emotions weren't allowed to pass through you. So they were blocked at different places, and those different places often mirror different places in your own body. Right? So you've got these all of these blockages to the flow of the emotion. Now, if I can allow my emotions to flow as they're being created, then all emotion will never be stored inside of me. I'll always be reflecting the emotion and feeling the emotion, but it will all just pass through me naturally. The problem with these stored emotions are that we've got hundreds of them. Because in our childhood we, we learnt to store them, I and even one event can store, as we've illustrated in the past, can store lots and lots of different emotions. So we might have hundreds of these blockages. In. Now every one of those blockages is like a barb, like a, you know, like a, a barbed arrow sticking in you, if you like, at the soul level. Now, to pull out a barb requires the experience in this case. Because remember, it was the, the thing that created this blocked emotion was that we weren't allowed to have the flow of emotion. So what needs to allow now, what needs to happen is all of these emotions need to flow. It's the flowing of the emotion that allows God to actually come in and pick it out. Now, as you've pointed out, in one particular event, there may be like 10, 20, 30 different emotions created that we didn't allow to flow because it wasn't allowed at the time. And then because of that, it's stored in our soul condition, and then other events got triggered from that, which then created their own stored emotion on top of that, and then other events got triggered, which created another set of stored emotions on top of that. So instead of having this one emotion now of unworthiness sitting in here from one event, I now have like a great big pile of these emotions inside of me, all different events that happened, all that I stored that couldn't flow because I wouldn't, couldn't allow myself, and usually it's because of my parents or environment, couldn't allow myself from experiencing them. So now let's say we're in the condition where they start to flow, which is the condition you're in, right? So these emotions start to flow. So what can happen? You've now got like this pile of them, inside of yourself, of emotions. Your soul is like that, just there's all this pile of emotions, and there's this pile of emotions reflecting the one type of emotion, like unworthiness or whatever it is. Now, if all of those emotions just flow out of you at the same moment, then you would have a lot of difficulty coping or living through the experience. So what's got to happen is your soul's got to expand from this shriveled up place where it can't feel any of those emotions, into this place where it can grow enough to actually feel and cope with those emotions. Now, that is going to mean this process of letting some of the emotion out and your soul expands, right? Now, your soul can't expand without these emotions flowing from you and this is very dependent upon your will. So while I have the will and these emotions flow out of me, then God can come and help me through that process. But the reason why God can't just come and grab all of those emotions and take them away from me is because my soul needs to expand in order to experience them. So there's going to be a time process, a time process where my soul's expanding, I'm experiencing a bit more, my soul's expanding a bit more, I'm feeling a bit more of that same emotion. Now in my case, I've had really, really deep like hurts that needed to be healed and a great big mountain of emotions. And so often I'll be crying for four hours, but it will be about one or two or three or five or ten different emotions in that one experience, but it's not all of the emotions that I feel about that particular thing. 
Now, if we're younger, like yourself, you'll find that you'll get through those emotions a lot more rapidly, and you'll have all these facets come up one after the other after the other, even in a few minutes. Now, that doesn't happen as much for myself because there's a huge pile of them, and there's a lot more of them for me to experience. It's just a matter of allowing yourself to actually go through that process. So when you get to the emotion that has caused this event, you going through these layers, is there a need for you to be crying for much time? Like, or no, you doesn't will God only... just go, okay, you're at the causal thing now, let's take it away? God can take away any emotion as long as you're prepared to feel it in its full amount. The problem is that most of us aren't prepared to feel it in its full amount, and so God can't take it away. He can only take it away to the degree we're prepared to feel it. Does that make sense? Like, so it's based on our will. If our will is allowing all of our emotions and we're prepared to be overwhelmed by them, then God can take away more of it in that first process, if you like. But if our will, or we've got this pile of emotions, like in my case, one after the other, after the other, after the other, and there's a long set, in my case, a long set of memories, which are also piled into emotions of, of a longer life than the average person. So what's happened is there's much more for me to experience as a result of that. Does that make sense? But when you allow the emotions to start flowing, what you're doing now is letting them out. It's our free will, where we love ourself, that causes us to allow these emotions to flow out of us. As soon as we exercise our free will, God can work with us. If we're not exercising our free will to feel those emotions, God is using external things to try and trigger those emotions, of which the main one is the law of attraction, in order to trigger those emotions inside of us. So the key is for yourself is to understand that God can certainly grab hold of these emotions and take them away from you very rapidly. Your question is also prompted by some spirits who have the same feeling, like if they start this process of emotions, why is it that God can't just grab them and, and deal with them. God is already doing that, but God is dependent upon your exercise of your own free will, and your own free will is dependent upon how much you're willing to expand emotionally. The other thing that's happening is, just say you're in a capping emotion, you're feeling some rage, um, I'm finding a lot, you'll be in that state and sort of saying, I okay, I'm angry, something's caused this great rage in me, I want to do, get to that what's causing this and it doesn't come up so you get more angry, more rage and you're like all the self-judgment of I don't like who I am now because I don't want to, I want to deal with what's causing this and then frustration and all that. It, it's like sometimes there's things inside of you that just won't budge no matter what. You think of your anger like a door. Here's your grief or your fear, or other emotions like shame that your anger might be covering, right? So these are the causal emotions. This is like the capping emotion, the anger. The fastest way to get to your grief is to walk through the door. Now what most people do is they have a lot of judgment emotions about anger. So let's list some of them, like anger is not spiritual. Right? God doesn't like me if I'm angry. I'll get punished if I'm angry. How many of us feel that one? Like from our childhood, we were punished every time we were angry. So of course we believe that if I'm angry, I will be punished. So you could say these were all the, there's a heap of blocking emotions about the anger itself. Can you see that? So what's happening in your case, Josh, is that there's a block, heap of blocking emotions about the anger itself. And so rather than trying to get to the grief, or even for yourself trying to get to the anger in a full experience, the key is to feel the blockages. So what are the belief systems? Pray about the belief systems you have about anger. What are they? And you'll find they'll come from your childhood about, you know, what you were... Anger was a very... Uh, was an emotion that you weren't allowed to experience very much in your childhood at all. Allow yourself to work your way through those blocks then the anger will be present. Allow yourself to feel the anger like a doorway into your grief. So that's when you go out, once you're in that state, you can go out and start punching the bag and feel the rage and anger inside of you, right? And then when you feel that very rapidly, usually usually 
if there's no blocks to your anger and there's no blocks to your grief, within 20 to 30 seconds, you will go from that place to that place. Does that make sense? Now, many of you have seen recently how people who have been projecting anger at me have been projecting anger at me for weeks or months. So they're not allowing this to occur. They're not allowing themselves to get th through the door of their anger and into their grief. So there's some blockages occurring. And there will be beliefs about anger, beliefs about grief, and so forth that, that we need to also work our way through. Now these, God can't help us with specifically except by exposing them through our law of attraction. God's laws are already helping us to expose them. But God can't take them away from us because they are our choice to retain. That's why they block. They are actually the things we do to retain and not deal with the underlying causes. Does that make sense? So the key is to look at this area. Once we, if we're in the state where we know we've got grief, and then we're in a state where we know we've got anger but not really experiencing it, then we've got a set of beliefs inside of us that are blocking that process from occurring. Ask God about those beliefs. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks for that. Good. Karen, thanks. I just want to go back to when um, Josh was saying if you keep about you know feeling the same emotion and you're saying your soul's got to expand to feel it some more. So... If you're feeling the same emotion um, all the time, how do you know that it's your soul expanding rather than you feeling a self-deception emotion? Well, if you're feeling a self-deception emotion, your law of attraction won't change. So you know straight away when you're feeling self-deception emotion. So if I feel an emotion today, my law of attraction doesn't change, I feel the emotion tomorrow, my law of attraction doesn't change, then obviously I'm still in the self-deception place. When I feel even one little part of my causal emotion, the law of attraction will change. And it will only change in the facet in which I've dealt with it. So you might deal with the emotion of unworthiness, but it might be unworthiness in a particular situation that you're dealing with, and you'll find that situation is no longer attracted to you anymore. So, for instance, you might have a feeling of unworthiness that's attracted while you're driving a car, where people treat you as if they haven't seen you all the time. right? You deal with that emotion, and then when you're driving a car, everybody seems to notice where you are and nobody tries to run you over or anything. So you've dealt with that particular facet of that unworthiness. But let's say you have unworthiness about being a woman sexually. Then that is still going to be kept being triggered, even though you've dealt with the other emotion. And so every emotion has its own particular nuance. It has its own particular flavor that was created by its own particular set of events. And we need to be patient with ourselves when we're dealing with emotions. But understand that our law of attraction will automatically change every single time I deal with a facet of the emotion. The key is to notice what's happening in our lives. Now, what I've found in myself is that I've had my law of attraction change in little area here, but not in that area there. Little area here, not in that area there. And I've had to take notice of that to see what I'm denying and to see what I'm actually trying to shut down inside of myself. And every single time I've found I'm shutting something down or something about that flavour of that emotion that I'm still not willing to experience. In other words, there was something about the flavour of the emotion that I was blocking. So I felt one part of it because I could allow it, but I was not feeling the other part of it because I couldn't allow it. And, and you need to be patient with that. Many of you still expect to be able to get this unworthy emotion, for example, and pop it out of you like a baby right? <laughs> and it's all gone, right? And it's not like that because the unworthy emotion inside of you was created by so many different events and so many different situations which every situation had a suppressed emotion attached to it and also happened with so many different genders and so many different ages of people and there's all these different creations, you see. And so your unworthy emotion might in itself have lots and lots of facets. But if you're humble and appreciate your law of attraction and love your law of attraction, love yourself in other words, you'll find that all of them will be exposed in time. And part of loving yourself is being patient with yourself. So be patient with the process. You see, when many of us have a causal emotion of you've got to fix things today. If you haven't fixed it today, you're no good, you're useless, 
you, you know, and how many times have you had that emotion dumped on you in your life? And that emotion we often are dumping on ourselves almost constantly when we're on the divine love path. So what we need to do is have more love of ourselves and allow ourselves to see all these beautiful things happening as accessing our causal emotion, but be patient with yourself. I'll give you another example. Sorry, I'm not going to ask questions just yet because we're going to break in a second, but I want to give you another example before the break. Very recently, well, for the last five years, six years in fact, I have an allergic reaction to kiwi fruit. I can, before five, six years ago, I could eat kiwi fruit to my delight as much as I wanted. And I could eat them one after the other. In fact, I used to. I used to cut up 10 or, 10 or so and have them for breakfast. And then as soon as I found out who I was, for some reason I can't eat kiwi fruit anymore. And be blowed if I can find out the reason why. <laughs> I've got no idea why this is this, this kiwi fruit thing going on. I used to love kiwi fruit and kiwi fruit were great. But what happens in me now is I, have, I just have to have one piece of kiwi fruit and I get this air compression thing happen inside of my gullet that feels like my gullet's going to burst open. right? And all this wind just gets trapped in there. My throat all constricts, all these muscles all through here all just constrict. Um, like I imagine a lot of people must feel when they eat um, nuts or something like that. And all this in here, this never happened to me before. All this in here constricts and everything. And there's this terrible pressure in here, and it feels like I'm going to burst in half here. Like it's just a very, very painful experience. Every single time I accidentally eat a kiwi fruit, this happens. So on our trip away, this happened because I had some fruit salad and there was little pieces of kiwi fruit. I thought she'd be right, I would have dealt with this emotion by now. All right, and away I go, and within about two minutes, it was, I was in this state, which I stayed in for nearly two hours. Um, now, I haven't found the causal emotion for that. If anybody has got any suggestions, <laughs> I'd be very happy <laughs> to hear them. I've got no idea why this has happened. And, uh, and it's only happened with kiwi fruit, and there must be some connection emotionally that's occurred, that's happened, that's changed in the last six, six years ago. And I've got no idea what it is. I know, I know what it is. You know what it is? Yeah, need to speak to kiwis. Need to speak to kiwis. <laughs> How many? In it? There's a lot of Kiwis in the audience, isn't there? Yeah, there's quite a few. I speak to you, don't I? Like, yeah. I don't think it's about that. It's a, there's something related to this emotion about who I am, and that's if, you know it's it's being reflected there. And I don't know why it's got to do with kiwi fruit and nothing else, um, but um, kiwi fruit guaranteed causes this. By and due, other food causes this. When I'm talking about, um, if I'm talking about my life, my life in the first century or anything like that, while I'm eating, I automatically get the same problem. But kiwi fruit, so I understand that linkage, but kiwi fruit causes it immediately. What's the first linkage? Well, with kiwi fruit, there's no conscious, what I would call conscious linkage. And this is the thing that you'll find at times with your own processing. You just get so frustrated. What's the conscious linkage here? i just got no idea what it is. So what I've had to do myself is I've had to be patient about the issue. I've had to just allow myself to just keep pondering about it. I'm praying about it quite a lot and pondering about it and sooner or later I know I'll get to the result. But do you know what the problem really is? The problem really is that I must have a pretty big block to finding out what it's all about because it's been happening for six years and I still haven't found out what it's about. So the issue is actually that I have an emotional blockage towards really finding out about it and I probably don't really want to know what it's about. Does that make sense? Sorry? Did someone throw them at me? <laughs> Not recently. <laughs> Kiwi fruits in effect. No, I don't think... I, I've thought about that, but we didn't have them then, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> So I've got, still got no idea what it is. Can you say it into the microphone, please? Thank you. Sorry, it's just that we want to record these things. A little earlier you said, when I first realised who I was or found myself, 
I started, it's six years that you've been getting this reaction. That's right. There's a linkage there somewhere. There is a linkage maybe that you were overindulging or that there was something about the kiwi fruit that may have made you choke or whatever at the same time because you said you're getting the same pain about the first century. Yep. It's always about that, so I know that. So what at the same time occurred to do with kiwi fruit? I don't know. Because That's the same right. reaction's coming up. But those, yeah, but That's those right. two remember. are definitely linked. Definitely. I know that for certain. And they're obviously linked from that very early stage. There's, there, it will be one day early in that stage that they're linked, surely. Exactly, exactly. But I don't know what it is. <laughs> That's but it doesn't have to be anger, fear, terror, whatever. It may just be that time and that connection uh, that it was because of the first century you got the pain, not because of the kiwi fruit. You blame the kiwi fruit and it keeps happening with the kiwi fruit. <laughs> Would no. you agree that may be the case? I believe anything may be the case. <laughs> I just haven't found what it is. No, it's, well, the issue for me is with all of these things you see, it's all emotional, right? So I can do all of this intellectual stuff, right? Which I have done, trust me. Um, and I've done all of this stuff exactly what you've just done with me, right? I've done to myself over and over and over again, trying to work out what it's all about. I've had a chats with Mary about what it's all about and whatever else. But at the end of the day, I still haven't found the answer. So do I want the answer? No. So this is the thing I've got to realise. I'm not loving myself here because I don't want the answer and I've got to work my way through this issue until I love myself enough to know this answer, whatever that is. And when you do that, you will then find the answer and the emotion will flow shortly after. I know it's a fairly big emotion because... This constriction of all this stuff here is all about holding on to grief, right? That's what happens. You, you, when you go to a funeral, many of you have gone to a funeral and have been like a friend or a best friend or a child or a parent or something like that, you, you know when you try to suppress your grief, you get all this terrible pain all the way through here, don't you? And all this all, you notice that? Like this terrible pain all through your jaw and everything when you're trying to keep it down. That's the kind of pain that I get when I eat kiwi fruit. So I know that it's to do with some big grief somehow, but I've still not discovered what it's all about because there must be some big thing in me about being frightened about what it's all about, which I need to deal with. But anyway, what we'll do at the moment, it's 10 past 3, so what we'll do is maybe have a break until 4 o'clock and then uh, if you'd like to return for our discussion, feel free to do so.